Hello everybody, welcome to the first Mover Mailbag of 2020. I'm Mover, C.W. Lemoyne, author of the Spectre series and the Alex Shepard series. Going to answer your questions that have been uh, accumulating since the last Mover Mailbag, but first I want to take a minute uh, to remember a friend of mine that passed away a few days ago, New Year's Eve. Uh, he was a captain uh, with my airline. I first met him flying a trip when I was on probation several years ago, and we became friends. He was very enthusiastic about the books, very big fan, even to the point that he was probably one of my biggest advocates. And um, I always would send chapters to him as I wrote them, and he was pushing me to um, continue and pushing me to write the next chapter and very excited about the books. Uh, his name's Captain Mike Hayes, and unfortunately, uh, suddenly, he passed uh, New Year's Eve. So uh, just want to take an opportunity to honor his memory, and uh, I'm sad. I mean, it, it's just, uh, he was a friend of mine, and, you know, it's very, very sad. So... Uh, not the way I wanted to, kind of news I wanted to get this morning and not the way I wanted to start 2020, but uh, um, uh, he leaves behind a, a wife and, and beautiful daughters. So uh, just keep them in your thoughts. It's kind of a, kind of a sad way to start. Today's episode, I've got a couple questions I'm going to answer. No, uh, nothing sarcastic, no mean uh, emails that I remember, but uh, wanted to answer your questions and hopefully help some people with uh, making them tell you no in 2020. So here we go. First question comes from Kylan, I think. Kylan or Keelan? Sorry if I mispronounce your name. Good evening. I was flying IMC in a 182, I'm assuming is what this means, in a broken cloud deck a while back, and Atlanta Center called traffic at my 3 o'clock 2F18s. I saw 2F18s in close formation. I couldn't really tell how close they were, as I was busy myself, and I only saw them two or three seconds in the clouds. But to this day, I was always curious how the Navy did this in IMC. I heard you mention something about wingtips and weather in your real or fake Maverick video, and it jogged my memory to ask. Cheers, Kylan. Yeah, we fly fingertip. So just very close formation. You can see the position lights. I mean, you, you get close enough, you can see it. Unless it gets really bad, in which case you do what's called lost wingman, which is um, getting separation from the formation because you can no longer maintain formation. But usually you can maintain uh, a fingertip position. You can also do what's called sensor formation. So either using data link or you can do a radar trail so we can lock each other up with the radar to fly through the weather. So that's kind of how you do it. It's not a huge deal. We train for it all the time and practice it all the time. And uh, uh, it just sucks if you get separated in the weather, then you have to worry about getting separate clearances and, and making sure we don't hit each other and, and working a way to uh, get back together. So anyway, next question. This comes from Ryan. CW Lemoyne, I have a question for you given your knowledge of both military aviation and general aviation. A little backstory is required here. I was active duty Army me for 10 years as a forward observer. I worked hand in hand with JTACs and pilots. I had multiple deployments to Afghanistan and I've always appreciated the work pilots do. Towards the end of, my, end of my career, I sustained injury while jumping with the 82nd Airborne Division. I was given an early retirement. After a brief hiatus, I decided to get a degree. Initially, I was pursuing a BS in aviation, working on a pilot, private pilot license through my university. Thanks, post 11, post 9 11 money in hopes of eventually earning my commercial pilot license. Initially, I was granted my medical, but after five months of flying and working towards my par private pilot license, the FAA pulled my medical due to being di diagnosed with PTSD in the military. They sent me a letter describing a list of required AMC appointments I could, would have to complete in order for the FAA to review my eligibility to fly with no guarantees. The cost of AMC doctors no guarantee of being given my medical back forced me to abandon my dreams of continuing to fly. My question is for those of us who are prior military who were diagnosed with PTSD, what is your advice towards still being able to fly? I think it would be naive to think the pilots to some degree don't develop PTSD from flying combat mission. How does the military deal with this for pilots? If a military pilot has been diagnosed with PTSD, leaves the service, whether it's an ETS or retirement, will the FAA pull their medical certificate as well? It's my hope that someday I'll be able to get my medical back and continue my training. It's like Splint said, there's nothing like flying your own mission and the joy of aviation. Thank you for taking the time to read this email, and I hope you have some information you can provide me. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any information. Uh, I looked this up on the FAA's website, and it's exactly what's happening to you. They require uh, diagnosis, and they have to know your treatment history and why it's caused and all that. I will say, in general, I think there is a mental health stigma which not only causes issues like this, but also prevents people from getting the treatment that they need because I don't think it's handled as well as it could be. So uh, my only advice is to be honest. If you're in this situation, I know it sucks, but 
what you don't want to have happen is to have uh, VA disability for PTSD as happened recently and you go get your medical and you don't disclose it and the FAA digs through your records they find out and now you're going to jail. That actually happened to two pilots uh, in California uh, a year or two ago. So uh, it sucks. All you can do is give them the information that they're asking for and hope that it works out in your favor. There's a lot of pilot advocacy groups that can help you. I think AOPA has some, most airlines have some, but uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the way we deal with mental health in this country and the way we help people or don't help people uh, is really lacking. And I think we could do a better job, especially of helping our veterans coming back from, from war and doing the job like you did. Uh, and by the way, thank you for your service and thank you for being boots on the ground. I mean, Jesus, that's uh, there's a lot to that. So I know you probably uh, went through a lot and I appreciate, you know, you signed that blank check for us. So uh, anyway, I wish I had more information, but uh, yeah, I make them tell you no, just keep pushing and hopefully you'll get your medical back and uh, get back to flying. All right, this is from Lucas. Hey Mover, my name's Lucas. I'm a staff sergeant at Hurlburt. I've been in just over four years now with an aviation maintenance career. I've been going to school full time since I finished technical training. Currently have a CCAF degree uh, that's Community College of the Air Force, in Aviation Maintenance Technology, as well as a second associate's degree from a state college with a 3.8 GPA. Finishing up my bachelor's in aeronautic from Embry-Riddle, and I'm currently pursuing getting my private pilot's license. I'm pretty early in training at about 10 hours currently. My pilot and navigator scores on the FOQT were 89 and 92. I'm waiting to take the TBAS till March because that's when you submit flight hours. I'd like to have as much as possible because they increase your PCSM. April 2020 is the first time I'm eligible to, eligible to apply for OTS. The only job I will apply for is pilot. What advice would you give me or anyone else in a similar situation to help in getting selected? Uh, dude, you're doing awesome. So uh, you're doing, you got a good GPA. That's good. Your scores are pretty good. Uh, you may uh, take it again, can potentially get higher scores, but I think you're pretty competitive there, especially if your PCSM is pretty high. Uh, if you've got any volunteer work, that, that helps. I would also recommend applying to not just active duty, but uh, find some guard and reserve units, throw your apps there, maybe try the unsponsored board for Air Force Reserve Command, and also throw your app in the Navy. I mean, naval aviation's awesome. You don't have to just fly in the uh, Air Force. So just throw your app as many places as you can and then take the first one that you get and go have a great career. I think uh, you're in the right track and I appreciate what you're doing and uh, just, just keep it up. All right, next question. Uh, this is from Jake. Jake says, I'm just going to start this off with a thank you. You have made videos that I've used for inspiration, especially with Make Em Tell You No. Also, thank you if this makes it into a video. <laughs> there you go. Uh, that would make my day. Well, I hope you're having a great day. Anyway, I have a question. If I were to join the Air National Guard, would allergies to cats, pollen, dust, ragweed, grasses, things like that disqualify me from being a fire pilot? I also have asthma, but it's very mild. Uh, I've not found the answers to any of these questions online, and I'm only in the fifth grade, which is probably too young to talk to a recruiter. Thank you for reading this, as it was most likely poorly typed, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, thanks for watching the channel. That's awesome. I'm glad you're taking an interest in this and the fifth grade. Um, allergies in general, it just depends. I mean, cats, probably not. Pollen, maybe. It, the, I'd have to look up in the waiver guide. And by the time this is a factor for you, the waiver guide will probably have changed multiple times. So, um, and also the asthma thing is going to de depend on uh, your age and when you stop treating it and stuff like that. So um, what I recommend is keep doing what you're doing, get good grades in high school, and uh, when you do go to college, maybe go AFROTC or Air Force Academy because those are very good options for you right now. Uh, if you've got the Civil Air Patrol, maybe join it. In the, they have many good programs for you to start flying uh, at a young age and learning kind of the military structure. Uh, and then those extracurricular activities will help you in general. Plus, play sports if you can. Make sure you're in good shape and just keep doing what you're doing. Don't worry about the stuff right now that can or might disqualify you because it is far too early. This is what I talked about when I told my story. I did the same thing, right? So I went to the optometrist. The optometrist said, you've got astigmatism, you're never gonna fly. Well, that was based off some really old information that she was giving me that I initially took to heart because you know I was fifth grade, sixth grade, whatever, and I thought for sure I'll never be a fighter pilot and there's no point in even trying. 
stuff changes. It's it's a moving target. You don't you can't say for sure now what it's going to be like in 10 years or, or 15 years or whatever when it's applicable to you. So what I suggest is just keep yourself in a good position, keep that dream alive, keep aspiring to it, and then when the time comes, that's when you can make them tell you no. You can get waivers for stuff. You can keep pushing. So don't worry about the, how you disqualify yourself. Worry about how to make yourself as qualified as possible so that when you get to that point, it's an easy yes and they can absolutely help you get that waiver that you need. So I hope that makes sense. I appreciate you watching the channel and thanks for your email. Next question. Uh, this The subject was your stupid question face. Uh, this is from Jay. Just recently discovered your YouTube channel and love the content, great stuff. I happened to pause a video as you were reacting to a stupid email and thought it was worth saving and sharing. Pretty funny. This needs to go on a shirt. This has, this is funny. Check this out. Isn't that awesome? Cool. Thanks, Jay. That was, uh, yeah, I laughed at that. All right, next question, or an actual question. Uh, A10. This is from Joshua. Hey, Mr. Lemoyne, I've been binging on your videos while I'm off work for the holidays. Love your channel. Just watched the November 4th upload in which you interview your friend T-Bear. This was a really cool interview for me personally as I was once a combat engineer. I'll never forget rolling in a convoy across the desert while an A-10 flew right over us. Had to have been within a few hundred feet. And tipped his or her wings as he or she pulled up and away. We never met the pilot, of course, but we immediately knew he or she was cool. Talk about something that made us feel safer on the ground as we drove into the unknown. Just knowing they were up there, standing by, eased our nerves. I feel a little teary-eyed just thinking about the day the pilot flew over us. We were all so nervous, and it was a small gesture of kindness that meant a lot to us. Kind of made us feel loved in a way. Does that make sense? Hadn't thought about this in years, but remember it like it was yesterday. Dude, this is giving me chills. Uh, and one of the things I remember most vividly about BASIC and AIT at Fort Leonard Wood was the constant burr sound of those guns going off as A-10 pilots trained there. I will always love the A-10. It made a great deal to those of us on the ground, more than I can put into words. I'm looking forward to starting your books. Thank you, Joshua. God, that's awesome. That's a cool story. You know, um, shows a force and shows a presence for us as fighter guys, even though, you know, the, the A-10, I'll say, is the ultimate cast platform as well as the Apache and the AC-130. But, you know, even in the F-16 and the F-18, being able to just go low and fast over the uh, boots in the ground just to let them know we were there was always awesome. And I think close air support is our greatest mission because there's nothing better than being able to directly support uh, the boots on the ground and, and help them execute their mission and be there. So I think that's cool. Uh, I have, I'm sure if the pilot that did that watched this, they'd be honored and that's exactly, they'd be like, yep, that's what I signed up for. That's awesome. So thanks for your email. That's really cool. I appreciate uh, the story. And I'm sure T-Bear, if he watches this, will appreciate as well. I'll let him know. All right, this message comes from Pete. Hey Mover, love the channel. I have 13 years and over 22 hours on the RV-9 Alpha I built with my family. I fly canine rescue missions for local groups. My plane trues out at 150 knots on six gallons per hour of car gas all day long. Highly recommend the experience. Here are some of the stories and he posted some links. Happy New Year, Pete. Dude, that's awesome. That's actually one of the things I was talking about in the video that if I do get an airplane, that's I absolutely want to get into canine rescue. I think it's awesome. Thank you for doing that. It's, I mean, dogs are amazing, and I recommend adopt, don't shop uh, to everyone. You know, they'll the, the life you save may be your own. Um, but that's something I'll, I definitely will try to get into if I get an airplane. All right, this one comes from Rob. Hi, Mover. Thanks for providing the great YouTube content. I've watched several of your videos over the last week. I'm hoping you can provide some career advice. Recently, I was selected for pilot in the USAF Civilian Board. I couldn't be more excited. However, I have some hesitations. Currently, I'm 30 years old, and while I want to fly and I believe it's the right career change for me, I would be taking a pay cut of $100,000 to join the Air Force. Haven't I, I haven't had success with guard units, so this is my best option to fly at the moment. Based on your experience, would you recommend to hold out for a guard unit or take the commission? Assuming I accept the job, my goal is to do as well as I can in flight school, hopefully get picked for fighters. That would be ecstatic to fly any airframe. Thank you for your time, Rob. Um, I can't answer that question for you. Do you want to serve your country and 
probably fly in the process or is money more important? To me, money can't buy happiness and it cannot buy service to your country. So um, I, I would take the active duty slot and run with it because a burden hand, I mean, because you're 30 years old, you hold out for guard units and it may be three, four years and now you're looking at waivers and now that's even more time. And to me, the best thing you can do is just take the slot, do your best, serve your country and then come back and worry about a high paying career later. And you may be able to do some side business or something, especially, you know, you can palace chase later in your career, go to the reserves, you know, at the 10 year point or whatever. But uh, to me, money cannot buy what Uncle Sam is offering right now. And that's the ability to go out, fly cool jets, whether it's heavies or even actual helicopters. Uh, and serve your country and be uh, and have an impact and have a purpose better high have a purpose higher than yourself so i honestly i would take it and run with it and not worry about the money and just just deal with it and, and military pay is not that bad i mean you're gonna have housing allowances you're gonna have flight pay it's not as bad as you would think so uh that's my advice but you know if you you could always just stay with your high paying job and buy your own jet if it's that high paying i mean that's an option too so Either way, you'll be happy. We'll take one more question and then I've got a cool email I got I wanna share with you guys. Um, this comes from Caleb. Caleb says, good evening, sir. I'm looking to pursue a fight in military aviation and I'm curious about the work personal life balance. Are fighter pilots able to spend quality times with their families or are they always stress planning their next mission? Well aware that the military is a sacrifice. I'm currently a weapons loader at McIntyre. Your answer will assist me as I apply different guardians around the country. YouTube channel has been a huge inspiration to me. Keep up the great work. Thanks for your time. Oh, you got time. Plenty of people have time for families. It's busy. So at home station, you, you go in, you know, you might have a long day, but when you're home, you're typically home. Um, you know, now granted when exercises are going on, you may be at, at the squadron longer, uh, and you're with an upgrade. You may be there longer if you're, you know, upgrading from wingman, the flight lead to instructor pilot and stuff, but you'll have plenty of time for your family. And most weekends you'll have off now in combat. Yeah. You'll be doing the job and you know, you'll be doing the mission and it's, you, I mean, you'll, you'll still have time to call home, Skype home and all that stuff. So, uh, I think you absolutely will have quality time. And I know plenty of people that have great families and get to spend quality time. Now, granted, you will miss some holidays due to TDYs, just like you're doing now, TDYs and deployments and stuff like that. But for the most part, when you're home, you're home and you, you know, you'll be, you'll be, have your family time. I don't think you'll be stressed about, you may, you'll be stressed during upgrades and stuff, but once the upgrades are over, it's kind of a, a normal day to day kind of, kind of flow to it. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. I think you'll, you'll enjoy it and you'll do fairly well with it. Finally, uh, this is not an email from the mover mailbag, but I thought this was cool. I wanted to give a shout out to the midshipmen of the Naval Academy to the 18th company. I heard you guys are watching guys and girls are watching the channel. I really appreciate it. I'm glad this is helping you and helping to keep you motivated. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Keep pushing ahead, kick some ass, graduate, become naval officers and hopefully naval aviators if that's what you want to do and be the next generation of fighter pilots. Uh, I got an email from Jet and I thought it was really awesome. So I just wanted to read that part because he was telling me that you guys are fans and I think that's really cool. And I'm, I'm just, I'm honored. I really am. I'm honored. I'm honored that this is having such a big impact and I just think it's amazing. So appreciate it. Thank you for watching. Anyway, so that will do it for this mover mailbag. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. If you want to mail me something, PO Box 8594, Mandeville, Louisiana 70470. You can email me, cwlemoyne, cwlemoyne.com. Find me on Facebook, facebook.com slash cwlemoyne. Uh, most of the time on Facebook, I'll refer you to the Make Them Tell You No Facebook group. So if uh, uh, it's facebook.com slash group slash make them tell you no. And because there's a lot of other fighter pilots that can help out and answer questions with their experience. And even people in the pipeline that are like in pilot training or officer training school that are doing this right now that may have more current information that can help you out. And we even have some medical folks in there. So consider joining that group. Uh, you know, it's just volunteers, people helping people. And I think because uh, that's, you know, rule number one, don't be a douche. But as part of that, help your help your buddies help your bros and and cooperate to graduate so uh you can also get me on twitter uh, cw lemoyne or instagram cw lemoyne 
Um, and uh, I hope you have a great uh, new year. I hope 2020 is starting out well. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time. Fire with the doors off. Don't be a douche. That's rule number one. Make them tell you now.